This is the I Read Comic Books Podcast. I am your host, Mike Rappin. Joining me this week, the faint sound of twin pixies drifting through the forest, Brian Murray. Hello. And Tia Vasiliu. Hello. Thank you all for joining me this week. I'm very excited to be back recording I Read Comic Books. I know I haven't been gone for very long, but it feels like it's been days and weeks and months. And quite honestly, I've had the wildest couple of I don't know, weeks or so. It's It's been a whole thing. But I'm here to talk with Brian and Tia about comic books. This is episode 338 for those of you at home that are keeping track. Before we get started today, I have one quick announcement. There's a Discord hangout happening on August 20th. It's going to be fun. Come and hang out. I, I think it's going to be a blast. You should be there. Be square. Uh, I think we're probably going to go into some comic book stuff. I don't know. That's a thing that we do sometimes when we hang out. But uh, yeah, a bunch of people are going to be there, and I think it's going to be a blast. So make sure you're there as well in our Discord. Check for the link of that in the show notes. But let's get into things. Let's talk about comic books, because I have two legally mandated questions I have to ask to get this show started, and that is, how have you been? How have comic books been? Let's start with you, Tia. Well, I have been pretty terrible. So I'll just, you know, be honest about that. I feel like it's good Mm -hmm. to just, you know, probably a lot of people are not having great brain days lately, mental health wise, Mm -hmm. like there's a lot going on. Um, So if you're feeling not great, uh, you are not alone and it's okay. It will be okay. I don't know. It's especially hard. (laughs) Go ahead. And it's especially hard when the sun is shining and you're like. I want to go outside and do things and the outside and doing things is the most terrifying thing in the world. I I get that. Yeah. Like I live at the beach and I have not been outside in six weeks, probably. Mm. Um, It sucks. Also, my neighbors are really obnoxious and they're constantly having pool parties and stuff. And I'm just like, can you be quiet? This is not a private pool. Other people live here. So if you hear <laughs> pool party in the background. <laughs> yeah. We know that it is it is some jerks in California. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Anyway. Typical. But, it, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, people, the ocean is literally 50 steps away. Can you go be loud outside in the ocean, not in the courtyard where it just echoes off of every surface into my apartment, into my ear holes? Anyway. Um, today, the day that we're recording, August 14th, is my one-year anniversary with Holiday, my beloved cat and best friend and familiar. So um, that is the like good news the, for the day, the good thing that I'm focusing on. And also, yeah, I did read some comic books. So let's get into it. Um, the first one that I read is actually a manga. And some of you may know that I'm not the biggest manga fan, but... I don't like to be the kind of person who's like, this thing is really popular, so I hate it. You know, like, (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I do like to be that person a little bit. But, you know, I think that my background as an art historian, like, I am trained to sort of be able to say, like, I don't like this thing necessarily, but everybody likes it. And I really want to understand it better. And maybe I'll understand more what I'm not connecting to. And like, maybe I'll find something about it that I like. I don't know. Like, I think it, it, my background lets me be a little more open-minded about stuff like that. So, so I, I read, um, the graphic novel manga style adaptation of the mortal instruments by Cassandra Clare. And this adaptation is, um, by Cassandra Jean And so I love the book. It's like a, there's like 11, 12 books in this series and they're all like 800 pages long and there's a movie and there's a horrible TV show called shadow hunters, which like is almost as crazy as Riverdale. Uh, It's not my (laughs) favorite. That's a big claim. (laughs) Uh, But you know, I pretty, I love the franchise. So I'm like, how, what better way to sort of like ease into it than to pick something I already like. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so just like quick plot summary, there's a quote unquote ordinary teenage girl and she learns that she's actually part of a race called shadow hunters who have angel blood in their lineage and they train to protect the world from demons, vampires and werewolves and fairies and warlocks, <laughs> just like magic. Um, and they use magic um, they like tattoo themselves with runes so th- with these magic wands so that they have superhuman abilities and 
within their ranks because of course there are like of course. magic nazis <laughs> oh wait hold on no not of course <laughs> i mean <laughs> and that's just the world today you're gonna have nazis yeah. <laughs> yeah, Jesus. and they're basically like we want to subjugate and torment the like other magical races like we'd protect the world from them because they're kind of bad sometimes but we want to go a step further and like actually persecute them so, hmm. um, you know, like the real Nazis were also very into magic. So I don't know. Yeah. But spoiler alert, the main character, Clary, is like connected to the head Nazi guy. Uh, she doesn't like her mom tried to hide her, but, you know, like they tried to escape anyway. So she has like extra super special powers because, of course, she does. Course. And you know along the way there's like a smarmy love interest the, actually the whole thing is a, is a like draco malfoy fanfic with the serial number scrubbed off so <laughs> like the, like if you if you're reading it and you're like this love interest sounds like if someone was really into draco malfoy you would be right and okay. yeah okay the, this this comes up a lot with uh 50 shades of gray in the <laughs> genre of like fan fiction that got turned into books yeah yeah it's a whole thing too if you love messy drama um look up cassandra claire and fan fiction because like there was a whole thing where she would be like sending i don't know people there's a maybe actually wait is it draco or is it spike from buffy fanfic i forget but cassandra claire definitely has a type and it's like blonde haired assholes uh, it's mean british blondes yeah. <laughs> yeah um and so there's a lot of fighting noises happening in the space of like people who read the fan fiction way mm. back when and then the internet was like scrubbed of it by the i'm assuming publishers because the franchise makes a lot of money and i don't know fun drama if that's your thing back there mm-hmm but um, yeah, my favorite character is a warlock named Magnus Bane, who is a sexy bisexual who dresses like Oscar Wilde meets Iris Apfel. Um, and he has a cat named Chairman Meow. This manga not only sounds insane, um, I'm looking through just like Google image results of this. I could totally see myself falling headfirst into this series. It's I, fun. I mean, it's really fun. And also, I would say so Cassandra Clare is a big manga fan, like in the book Clary um is a manga fan and draws uh like okay. she actually like is trying to get into art school and she's got and she's got like a graphic novel that she's making and stuff so you can tell like i think that's why it works so well because i think cassandra clara like i think her mind works that way because she's a fan i see i see well i mean it looks i mean it looks fun and it like not too i guess over the top but i'm curious to know like i think one of the big things you've called up in the past regarding manga and stuff is you're not always a fan of the art i guess with this book did your opinion change at all i would say this moved the needle a little bit closer because i felt like this art is almost like manga style with a slight art nouveau tweak to it Okay. Um, and the characters look exactly like how I pictured them when I read the book, which like obviously when you have um screen adaptations, like that's not always the case, and that can be really disappointing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But ultimately I still kind of hate the art because it doesn't like <laughs> <laughs> like when I think of Art Nouveau black and white, I think of Audrey Beardsley, and um there's always a lot of pattern and a lot of um like organic movement i don't know i what what i think i don't like about manga art in general and like i found this to be true for this book too is i need colors or patterns Mm -hmm. or shading Mm -hmm. like outlines are not enough for me they're just not enough. yeah Yeah, and, and looking at this book i just from the previews i can see this feels like a very I don't want to say basic, but very like simple art style, like very just the line work. And I think there's a lot of popular manga that does this really well. Um, but it, again, if you're not into that, it's just not never going to work for you. Whereas if you get something that's more complex, like I'm thinking like 
a berserk or <laughs> which i guess is insane but uh like a vinland saga or something where there is extreme amounts of detail or even witch hat atelier um added to this to the black and white and gray of the story it adds a different feel and a, i guess more attention to detail in a lot of ways and again of course weekly publishing blah 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 we could talk about the reasons why some artists do it and some don't but um if you're not into that simple line style, I can totally understand why you wouldn't dig this. Yeah, I just have to force my brain along. Because like, look, the only reason I read comics is for the art. Like, sorry, writers. I I vastly prefer prose for mm -hmm. reading for words and for, for plot and for story. Like, I really love to just look at the pictures and have the story be told through the art as much as possible when I read comics. And so mm -hmm. if I can't mm -hmm. get into the art with manga, it's just not happening. So, I mean, I don't know. Like, I... I real it's just how my brain works and it sounds so snobby to be like oh I'm I'm in a steat and I can't read something unless it stimulates my brain but like <laughs> I can't and I'm sorry it's not it's not manga it's not you manga it's me it's fine Hey I don't think there's any apology needed here I think the the thing is and Danny in the chat is already doing this we just need to find you the right manga <laughs> Yeah, um, it's like when one of your friends says they don't like coffee so what you do is you just keep giving them coffee to drink yeah, 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 yeah. Um, also, I'm please, sure... yeah, but that's also so annoying when you're just like, <laughs> but I just don't like it. Like, leave me alone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mostly kid. I mostly kid. But you know, we're gonna work on this in silent among a few friends of us, and then we're gonna come to you with a proposal to you. So don't worry. We're not gonna try to throw it all at you. We're gonna come to you with very curated recommendations. I think that's what's gonna happen. Um, <laughs> but I don't know anything else to say about this book. I won't beat on this dead horse any further. Um, yeah, it's it's bonkers and. And I think that anyone who likes um, like melodramatic love triangle, supernatural teenage wizard, all of that, like this is free. Mm -hmm. This is for you. This is for you. And you, Hell yeah. yeah. So I will kick it over to Brian. And the the movie is not bad. Like I don't know how it is as an adaptation. Like but every hot person at fun. the time in Hollywood was in that movie. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh man it, it's, it's, it's it's an incredibly sexy movie with some very cool monster effects i've heard so many okay you know what? We, this is not a mortal instruments podcast i think <laughs> we're gonna talk about this in the break uh but brian how have you been how have comic books been let's let's start with one of yours uh yeah speaking of incredibly sexy uh i've been okay i, I was a big fan of the the rogue squadron books growing up Mm -hmm. And they just started putting those out as like new, fully produced audiobooks. And so a lot of my comic book time has been absorbed by listening to those. I see. I um, see. But I did manage to read uh, or reread Deadpool Samurai Volume 1. Uh, this is a manga written by Sanshiro Kasama with art by Hikaru Uesugi. And it is uh, an absolute delight. Like, it never would have occurred to me to make a Deadpool manga, but it, it works so, so well. The the fourth wall breaking that Deadpool is always doing carries over into this, and it does so in such a way that, like, even if you're not familiar with, like, the the culture surrounding manga or the manga production or anything like that... um it still makes jokes about those things that are relatable enough to people mm -hmm. who aren't familiar with them that they, they can still laugh at it. But if if you do know about like the, the, like you were talking about the one week turnaround production system or whatever, mm -hmm. it's, it's much funnier. Like there, there's a line where Deadpool is talking to a, a villain and he's like, yeah, I'm going to feel bad about this. And the villain's like, feel bad for me. And he's like, no, for the assistant has to draw the next page. And then <laughs> the next page is a, a full page spread of a building getting blown in half. <laughs> like, awesome. Awesome. I, uh, I've, I've heard pretty good things about this. I, I think you maybe have mentioned, maybe I saw you say something about it at some point, but I've, I've heard positive things about this. So I'm really glad to hear that it like, it actually hits and works because I, you know, Deadpool is always like a very, very fine line when it comes mm -hmm. to writing that character. So um, it sounds to me like it, it hits for you. Yeah, it definitely does. It's not as like, I think the thing that for me is Deadpool works very well unless it's mean spirited. And yeah. I, I think that some people can get mean spirited with Deadpool. Uh, and this one's definitely not. This one is just like, 
let's have a good time making fun of tropes and conventions. Mm -hmm. I think also Deadpool cosplayers have just like put this kind of negative aura around the character so that like (laughs) people really bring that annoyance to any Deadpool encounter. And I think if you are able to sort of, I don't know, put that aside, the fourth wall breaking can be really funny. Definitely. That's (laughs) yeah. It's so funny that you say that though, Tia, because I think when I now when I think of of Deadpool, I do think of cosplayers and just like the cringy videos or TikToks I've seen of people like, I was at a convention and a Deadpool cosplayer did this. And it's like, why would he think that's okay? Because it's always a guy, you know? And it's like, uh, yeah, I've, I feel like I've had a very strange experiences at cons with Deadpool cosplayers as well. So yeah, I, I totally feel that. I was, I was online in 2010. I've seen it all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, there, there's a great part where they introduce uh, a couple of new characters, uh, one of which is Sakura Spider, which is the schoolgirl uh, spider person introduced in this book. Which, again, is another great fourth wall moment where Deadpool's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. They went for the lowest hanging fruit, whipped up a new Spider-Man. Got it. <laughs> Wait, I thought there was already a schoolgirl spider person. Uh, she's in the future. Yeah. Oh, of course. Right, right. You know, it's, it's different, different universe. Totally. You know, I mean, like we can't cross over. It's the whole thing. Uh, we also get we get manga Pretty Boy Loki. Um, if if you're familiar with like the the shojo guy face, uh, <laughs> that that's exactly what Loki is in this. Uh, for someone who can has... shapeshift, that is a choice. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. exactly. Uh, he has laser eyes now. Um, they come up once or not explained and never happen again. Um, no, oh, and Venom is attached to a pop idol instead of a uh, a journalist. So that's a that's a cool twist. Fun. So I this this sounds like it's a a really fun time. I'm glad I'm glad that this got translated because I know that there was like some question over it at some point of whether or not it was going to get translated. So uh, this came out pretty recently though, right? Yeah, like in the I, I think it originally was like 2018 or something like that, but the translation just hit in 2022. Gotcha. I was just gotcha. talking to a friend about how like 2014 to 2018 was the best era of comics in like the recent past. So. Yeah, this. That's, that's I would not... argue since the dawn of Hawks Pox that we've been. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. It's only a ten-hour uh, drive to get over there to kick your ass, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. I, that's true. I I also tried to read Star Wars: The High Republic Volume Three, um, but I couldn't because apparently my library card is broken. So either it's a technical glitch, or I've been Nick Whited by the Kent District Library System. <laughs> let's let's hope it's the it's the former let's hope it's the former what about you mike uh well one of the books i read this week was 007 number one uh this is the most recent 007 incarnation um from dynamite comics written by philip kennedy johnson art by marco finnegan colors by deborah kelly and letters by jeff eckleberry and i don't know what it is but i really want to like 007 comics like anything that's james bond in a comic book form, I want to like because I feel like comic book writers go as far away from they ca- as they can from all of the gross tropes of James Bond and instead try to tell like good spy thriller action stories. Someone like Greg Pak did like a really awesome run of James Bond. Um, and I've read some other James Bond in the past uh, that I, I really enjoyed. And so I saw that Philip Kennedy Johnson was on this one. And uh, I, I really enjoyed their work on aliens after Nick put, uh, you know, his bat to my throat and said, you must read this. And I read a bunch of alien comics and uh, I actually liked them. So I was like, let's see what else uh, PKJ has going on. That's what I call him, PKJ. And I think he uh, Johnson really leads into the idea of Bond on the outs of the UK government. And I think as I think other creators and other modern screenwriters have done in the past where it's this thing where we know who James Bond is as a culture, so why don't we just kick him out of his position and make him go rogue? Um, which I think is the thing that we've been seeing with Daniel Craig. Like in almost every single movie, he's always doing something outside of the law um, for one reason or another. And I think that this story actually works by adding a little bit of history to the 00 program. We learn about this 003 character. Maybe people who know more about James Bond know who this person is, but I didn't because I'm just some schmuck from the United States who doesn't read Ian Fleming books. But 
I, I like the way that they leaned into this idea of James Bond now wants to get revenge on this double O um, agent who was killed. And there's, of course, a project with a funky name that you can't pronounce because it's Swedish or something. And I, I, I like just the way that this first issue developed. Deborah, Le- excuse me, Marco Finnegan's art uh, is really interesting because it swirls the look of a chiseled like Darwin Cook, Cook style figure that has hints of different bonds, mostly Pierce Brosnan and Roger Moore, uh, which I, I think is interesting because I think other Bond artists in more recent past have tried to get more towards a Daniel Craig looking guy. And personally, I like the square jawed like chiseled look of uh of the like a darwin cook character and so i I like the way that finnegan did that with his art but yeah i don't know this issue was fun enough for me to keep reading i'm going to try number two um i love having a big dumb action-packed government conspiracy bullshit comic on my pull list so it's between this and all of the reckless books like i'm getting a really good sense of crime action mystery thriller stuff so i'm I'm totally on board for it it kind of like if i never heard you say 007 i would have thought you were just describing mission impossible yeah, well, and that's the thing. Like, I don't. I just watched the Gray Man. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you guys saw that. That's that. Uh, that Chris Evans and Ana de Armas and uh, who's the main Ryan Gosling movie that just came out, which is essentially I, like James Bond, Mission Impossible, John Wick, all mashed up into one thing. Um, I haven't seen it, but I've heard that Chris Evans really chews on the scenery in that one. <laughs> oh yeah, Chris Evans showed up to have a good time, and they happened to pay him. Like that's what the movie is. Um, and he's. <laughs> He's got a look. I, oh, we could talk about the Gray Man all day because it's such a bad, good movie. Like, there's nothing particularly great about it. Like, the Russo brothers clearly wanted to do something else with Chris Evans, but they didn't know what, and they just needed to get other cast members in. And Ana de Armas is is a great fit for the movie. I don't know. Overall, it's just like a dumb action movie that works because they don't explain everything. Because you, as a person who lives in modern Western society, is that's what I assume that they think the audience is. Um, understands all of the tropes of like governmental shadow conspiracy agencies so they don't have to do anything other than just tell the like let the action set pieces happen but yeah and and that's what 007 is go ahead Tia. i feel like no directors understand what to do with chris evans except maybe i can't remember the director now from knives out ryan johnson yeah yeah (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) like that was a good like i really felt like chris evans disappeared into the role of like rich mass hole but Uh um because because if, he if you like that kind of you should watch the gray man oh my <laughs> gosh he's so evil in this movie it's awesome yeah yeah but like you know throughout the like avengers movies for example i feel like no none of the directors really knew what to do with captain america mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and by not didn't know what to do with i mean let him kiss bucky <laughs> I feel like that's just a Captain America thing. Like even in the comics, nobody knows what to, what to do with that guy. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, well, it, I mean, if you're looking for some dumb action government stuff, like 007's fun. But uh, let's, Tia, let's let's talk about another book that you oh, read. Yeah. You had another one on your list. Let's hear about it. I did. I did pick another one because I I was like, oh, I should also have like something fun to talk about. So I picked a Hellboy book because Hellboy is always fun. <laughs> Heck yeah. And one of the, so I read um, Hellboy and the BPRD 1957 Falling Sky by Mike Mignola, Chris Roberson, Sean Martinsbro, and Lee Lowridge. I mean, hello, like such a great creative team. Yeah. But um, yeah, help. I'm just such a huge Hellboy fan. And one of the things I love about the Mignola verse, I guess it's called now, is that, um, you know, there are through lines in the stories, but there's also monster of the week books that you can just drop into and they're done really well, uh, which mm-hmm. I, you know, mm-hmm. for someone who doesn't always like the pressure of like, you must keep up with the stories every single month. Um, you know, like sometimes I just want to drop in and have a good time. And so Hellboy books are perfect for that. And yet I, I really love Mike, Mike Mignola's art no one will ever be mignola in terms of art but Mm -hmm. being your own artist but playing with the characters and kind of paying homage to the style um like i think that sean martin bro's style 
is definitely its own thing here, but he does a great job of like giving us like after Mike Mignola. And mm. and and so we know we're in Mignola verse visually without it just being like copying the style. And I also think that's um you have to give Lee Lowridge a lot of credit for the coloring because um like for me, what really stands out as Mike Mignola art is his use of blacks. Like it's very graphic. It's very Japanese woodblock print, very ukiyo-e. And um, I mean, like shout out to Dave Stewart, who mm-hmm. colored the, you know, the original Hellboy books, I guess. But like a colorist could carry you through in the different artwork or the different um, artists like artwork to keep you in the universe visually and to have that continuity. So love that, love that for us. And um, yeah, so this is the monster of the week one. And it's nice because like in within the Hellboy world, there's basic premise of they're here to protect us from monsters and, and also some, Oh, I guess Nazis are in all of my books, but uh, (laughs) I was going to say, we're talking about Hellboy here, (laughs) but like once you get it, the basic premise, it's really not that complicated. And so it's a really easy sort of like world to do monster of the week. And it doesn't feel like there's anything missing or it doesn't feel like it's like phoned in. Um, I mean, Hellboy volume three, the chained coffin and others is like just a collection of short stories pretty much. And they are so good. It's probably one of my favorite volumes of the original Hellboy. And yeah, so just like the monster of the week thing or like the short story thing is established really early on in the, in the Mignola verse. And so Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, I like that these newer story like arcs like the 1950s ones which also were just super aesthetic if you like the like mid-century style uh so sometimes there's continuity and then sometimes you could drop in so that's the kind of flexibility i need and i love it and so in this one it's a really quick, simple premise. There's this researcher. His name is Woody Ferrier. He's working as a cryptozoologist in the BPRD. And he is, his like goal in life is to discover a new species of cryptid. And Uh-oh. yeah. So he's like teamed up. He, even though he's a, he's a researcher, they're like, we're going to put you in the field. And so they pair him up with Hellboy. And when, of course. It, yeah. That like BPRD <laughs> hazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and like obviously humor is the one of the best parts of hellboy books and Mm -hmm. you definitely get that right away here because yeah like so woody's doing field work with hellboy and he's just like so done there's like all these banal run-of-the-mill common cryptids that they have to investigate and of course hellboy is like great that was easy let's go get pancakes and woody is like no (laughs) i want to find something i want to i want to have excitement and hellboy is like trust me you don't (laughs) I mean, I love that idea of Hellboy, even in 1957, right? Being like, honestly, dude, whatever you think you want, you absolutely (laughs) don't. Because at this point, what I've seen will scare you to death. (laughs) Like, that's amazing. Exactly. He's like, hey, nobody shot at us today. So just take take the W, man. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But um, as a former academic, though, I can relate to that frustration of like working your ass off for research. And then like you go out in the field and it's just not what you signed up to do. Um, Mm -hmm. And getting super bitter about it because being an academic sucks your soul out. And so like you need something, you need something so you could feel again. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So they're in Virginia. And they're investigating a report of like an alien or a mutated bear or maybe like an alien bear that mutated or like something like that. And anyway, like I'm not going to spoil it. It's none of those things. Woody gets really seriously injured, but he's thrilled. He's like having the time of his life because he finally gets to do something <laughs> fun. So <laughs> I get it. <laughs> That's great. I, I've i been meaning to like get back into these Hellboy the BPRD volumes just because like the numbered year ones seem like all like easy to access like easily accessible like you said like everything is kind of just pick up whatever you want and read it and i know that there's a handful of them out here at this point so i've seen like paulo rivera's covers which look amazing and i'm just like yeah give me some hellboy in my life i should do that that should be my next big read put that on the list of big reads that's becoming a big read itself they're always fun i love hellboy yeah i mean i was once a 12 year old desperately wanted to meet bigfoot so (laughs) i I see where Woody's coming from yeah yeah (laughs) Uh, Brian, what about you? Did you read anything else this week? Yeah, actually, this is an all manga week for me. Ooh. I read uh, 
volumes four through six of How Do We Relationship, which is a manga by an artist named Tammy Full. Uh, I've spoken about this before. Um, generally described it as like, this is my my feel good book where I go for like a sweet relationship between you know these two young women who meet in their first year of college. And, you know, they, they just fall in love and join a band, and it's great. And it's not anymore. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> it's like, I've always recommended it like that. And then, like, one of the first things that happens in the new stuff that I've been putting off reading is, like, well, they broke up, and one of them is going to run away and try to hook up with her her high school crush. And when that falls through, it become suicidally depressed for a while. And... Oh, what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It got it got dark, a little dark. Um, <laughs> Holy smokes! And it's it's definitely like a showcase of the different unhealthy ways people process a breakup. Because mm-hmm. you have like the the one person who fully shuts herself in her apartment and, and doesn't come out for weeks at a time, and her friends are very worried about her. Mm-hmm. And the other person who's just like, "What? No, everything's fine. I'm back to normal. I'm not. I'm not still fucked up. You're fucked up." <laughs> oh no. So yeah, I mean that's it's they're 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 very uh very shitty to themselves and others in, in these volumes. Things are on a better note at the end of six than they, they were at the end of four. It's it's still a little bumpy. They're doing that that thing that I've come to understand is traditional when a lesbian relationship falls apart where they just become awkward, weird friends instead. Okay. <laughs> I assume that they're they're going to get back together. That might just be like the shipper in me that wants them to get back together. Mm. But yeah, it's it, it's still very good. I still really enjoy it. Like it's it's still got that like I guess I, I I would call it like clean line work. Like it's very very simple. All the characters are very easy to recognize on sight. Uh, it's very distinct. See, as you're describing this, I'm like into the story. And if someone wrote mm-hmm. this as a prose like YA novel, I would read the hell out of it. But if you're going to make me look at the pictures, I would literally just throw myself in the ocean. Yeah, I, I, I was definitely when you were talking about it, I was like, all right, that's what I'm not going to recommend to you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Maybe light novels is really where my like focus should be. Yeah, you know, I I, I did, would never have thought about that. But that, I think that that's the perfect blending of the two things. So when we get the light novel version of how do we relationship, we'll make sure to get that to okay. you um, ship uh, directly. Is that I'll, a pun? I'll send you my my hundred and thirty thousand word fanfic. That too. That too. I love that. Um, you know this this book sounds interesting in, in like a this might be cathartic to read for somebody. You know, to to see how other people are reacting to a to a breakup and stuff. You know, as you see the relationship grow and then it you know changes over time. Like I feel like something like this. It may be you know go from go from this like warm and fuzzy story to a, a bit more intense, but um. I mean, sometimes reading that kind of stuff is super cathartic. Yeah, um, there are a lot of things in there that I really enjoy, like that are uh, not not quite subversions of tropes, but definitely things that get addressed differently than I would expect them to. Like there's there's one guy who's like, I'm so helplessly in love with one of these women. And one of the other characters is like, yeah, well, that's not her problem, dickhead. Get over it. I <laughs> love that. <laughs> I'm just like, yeah, it's not her problem. Stop being a weirdo. Did you guys see that article that came out recently that was basically like men are single and lonely because they won't like adapt to the raised standards of like emotional intelligence that women <laughs> yeah. are demanding of them now? <laughs> Whoa. I-, I did see that. Yeah. <laughs> Which, you know, as one of those women who is happily single and just like not here for that bullshit anymore, accurate. But that what what you just said reminds me of that. Because so many men are just like, what? <laughs> yeah. What do you mean I can't inflict my emotions on the world around me? <laughs> I mean, listen. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I feel like we all we have a pretty good collection of emotionally like available and aware men on this podcast. So good job, guys. Well, thanks. Um, it's definitely a learned skill. Yeah, it not is. a thing I was born with <laughs> nope. for sure. Definitely took me thirty four years to figure that out, and I'm not even thirty four yet. Um, 
So I'm going to just jump into my last book that I read um, before we get into my full on full blown therapy sessions. Um, (laughs) I read one more book uh, that is was kind of a cathartic read uh, called Keeping Two. This is by Jordan Crane. Um, This book is I don't know how to describe it because the synopsis gives away a lot of the story. um, But I don't think that the story is really the point of the book, which is a weird way to say that. it's really the journey of the story because it's extremely chaotic in how the story is told. Um, like the book opens with a couple in a car and they're reading a book. Like one, the person who's not driving is reading to the driver um, as they're, you know, instead of listening to an audio book or something. And it's a story about a family who's on a boat and the boat is sinking and they're trying to get out and like, it's sad and somebody has to sacrifice themselves. Um, but the story keeps cutting back to the couple as they clearly had some sort of argument earlier in the day and they're trying to like take their minds off it by doing something kind of together one person reading and the person listening um and so we keep getting cuts to them and then flashbacks and then back into the story and it's extremely chaotic the whole book is like this and they get home and the story in the book continues as one of them continues to read the book and the other one leaves and we don't know where the other person went and so in, in an almost true to life sense, at least for me, um, the person in the story uh, who stays home starts to think what happened why they're, while they're gone. Why is it taking them so long to get back? Um, and it goes from there. It starts to spiral in these like in- series of intrusive thoughts within the story that the person's reading, within the person who's reading's head, within other people that are not related to the story. We start to see all these different perspectives. And the book floats around between characters so willy nilly. It's You almost have to like go back and read it a second time to fully understand it. And it's frantic and stressful and anxiety inducing. Uh, it's a book that feels so close to real life that I don't know if this is someone retelling a thing that happened to them or not, but I felt like Crane was trying to channel something like a, a thing, a, an issue that they have with intrusive thoughts and worry and their own anxiety and putting it to paper. And I, I felt like it's it's almost like scary to see how well someone could describe all of that. If you've ever had that happen to you, where just lots of bad thoughts just come into your head and they just keep spiraling and spiraling. Um, Crane manages to tell this story um, that is about how someone handles that. And I, I found it to be just overwhelming and extremely cathartic in reading because I suffer from that. I'm sure a lot of people do. I'm sure most people do. Um, and to get this all kind of compressed into like a 200 page book is really, really impressive. Uh, the art style is really, really simple, but I think the meaning of the story and what they were trying to do with it is very clear in the end. And yeah, I, uh, it made me feel bad. It made me feel good. It like <laughs> all at once. So, uh, if you're looking for something that's really going to fuck you up on a Sunday night, <laughs> I highly recommend keeping two. Yeah. That sounds like my personal hell. Yeah. Um, and it, I, I'm the type of person that I read something like that and I get a lot of like, I don't know, like weird therapy out of it in that seeing someone else and being able to relate to them. But I could see someone reading this book and just being like, nah, man, this is this is going to trigger something for me. Yeah. Like like that kind of stuff for me is always much more of like, see, this isn't just in your head. This is a real thing that happens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and like, no, it's just also a thing in their head. And I can mm-hmm. I can understand that intellectually. But but we aren't always in touch with that part of our brain. I get yeah, that. I'm very good at regulating how my emotions come out. Not so good at managing the the whirlwind inside. Yeah. No, yeah. I'll be like, I am working out twice a day, seven days a week, and I have 12% body fat. I'm doing great. And people are like, please go to the hospital. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we're going to take a quick break. Um, and when we come back, we're going to talk about comics that are on the top of our pile, as well as some of the folks that are hanging out with us on Discord and their picks as well. So we'll be back in just a second. Today on IRCB, we're going to be talking about comic books you guessed it i know that you came to the i read comic books podcast for something other than comics but we have comics that we're looking forward to this week this is the top of our pile we're talking about comics new and old anything that we're going to be reading next so if this is your first episode welcome you made it over at the halfway mark i'm glad that you went this far but today we're going to be talking about comics that we're looking forward to the most so i guess to get things started brian what is on the top of your pile this week 
Uh, this one's a little bit of a shout out to Danny. Hello, Danny, in the chat. Uh, we have Deceased War of the Undead Gods. I did not know this was happening because I don't follow DC, really. Um, this is written by Tom Taylor with lines by Trevor Harrison, uh, inks by Andy Lanning, and colors by Rain Barreto. It's always a nice surprise when I find one of these because I, I picked up the first Deceased volume on a whim off hoopla at one point i i think it's still the best like zombie comic that i've read let really? al- let alone like the best superheroes zombie comic that i've read uh and, and part of that is because a lot of zombie comics are not very good so it's not mm. like the you know the bar is a tripping hazard in hell but it, it is still like very well written it feels more like this is actually a story somebody wanted to tell and not something that was just like a, like in, in a meeting, some CEO wouldn't, Hey, wouldn't it be fucked up if, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. is what Marvel zombies feels like. <laughs> yes. I mean, back in the day when Kirkman was writing that, it's, it felt like a very original thing. It's not like he was Shut writing the, the biggest. Fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, also now I think we all have a very different perspective on a zombie situation which is oh, like yeah. oh yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> that would oh happen. this is just a way for you to exercise your fantasy about shooting people got it right yeah um and dc remind me of what this story is like because i i feel like you've talked about it a bunch and i know you've told me a bunch but i can never keep it in my head uh, it's been a while since i read the original um so my my memory is a little hazy but it's basically like the uh the anti-life equation gets out of hand and right. people start okay. you know people are too paying too much attention to their phones so they turn into zombies yeah. oh right oh yeah i forgot that's what it is they're on their phones and it turns them into zombies right 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 yeah i remember it being something ridiculous but then everyone's saying and including you like no 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 it's actually good um so i i think maybe one day they'll, they'll do a big deceased deep dive or something like that could be fun yeah definitely the 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 latest Marvel zombies that I read was actually not that bad. I, I don't want to slander them completely. Okay, that one was a, a, a similar in that it like it came from space as some kind of like weird thing, mm-hmm. and not just hey, there's zombies now. Spider Man's gonna kick his leg off and then be sad about it. <laughs> Uh, which is the thing that happens in Marvel Zombies. Spider Man just fully like breaks his leg and it just comes off. Oh, oh! <laughs> you you've read Marvel that. Zombies, right? I I have, but I feel like I blotted a lot of it out of my mind because I think I was inundated with a lot of zombie content at the time. Um, and I know that I owned a lot of those Marvel Marvel Zombie comics too, like in physical form back when I was just buying anything that had the name Kirkman on it. So you know, I totally, I feel like I read this. I yeah. just remember the covers mostly. Um, there's but. there's one part where like after after the Marvel zombies eat brains, they like begin they like get their their consciousness back, kind of like the, mm. the hunger takes control. Otherwise, right, and right, right. Zombie Spider Man immediately starts getting maudlin about having eaten Aunt May, and the the vibe in the other zombies is very like, oh, here we fucking go, <laughs> this this shit again. <laughs> <laughs> poor peter parker too bad he can't age um sorry i don't yeah. want to i don't want to just get like that. whatever however a spider book we hear about uncle ben dying every time mm-hmm. uh zombie spider-man eats brains we hear about aunt may i see i see um this is batman in the pearls i see okay gotcha uh well <laughs> tia <laughs> sounds like before, a band <laughs> before i get any any more just cynical about big two comics um what are you excited for what are you reading next and what's on the top of your pile well speaking of bands I am mm. so excited to see that Simon Hanselman has put out another Meg and Mog book. This yes. one, I know. Uh, just a teenage dirtbag, baby. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, it's uh, it's called Below Ambition, and it's about um, a band called Horse Mania, which uh, Meg, Mog, and Owl have formed, mm-hmm. the quote-unquote worst band in town. I definitely hung out with some version of Horse Mania as a teenager. Uh, <laughs> Fanagraphics <laughs> describes it as 
Meditation on Youth, Performance, and Memory, which sounds really cerebral for a book series that has so much filth and depravity and like buttholes as these books do. But <laughs> that's definitely the beauty of them. And Simon and Hanselman is really smart about it. So um, I'm very excited about this one. It looks like the the digital version came out last week. And then, okay. yeah, but it's not in print until the end of October because there's going to be a, a flexi disc horse mania single involved in the book. Uh, Google tells me a flexi disc is like a, like a vinyl. Uh, so <laughs> maybe Paul can, can play it for us and like hold the phone up to the speaker or something. Cause I don't have a record player. I don't know anyone yeah. except Paul who has a record player, <laughs> but um, yeah, I want the hardcover. I have all the Megan Mog books in a hardcover because I like to read them and, touch the pages and and like they're really beautiful books even though they are about these like teenage dirtbags so uh yeah. they're nice to have and and i reread them a lot there's something about the megan mog books or the mega hex books in general that are it's so disgusting but then you come out of them feeling like like better because someone else did all of this other stuff i know we're talking a lot about like cathartic reads today because that's how i read comic books apparently but Simon Hanselman manages to like tell these stories that are just insane and ridiculous and filthy. And it's like scratches an itch in my head. I, I don't know if you feel the same yeah, way. Where it's yeah. just like, I needed to get that grossness out and Hanselman manages to do that. Cause we're all a little bit gross and we're all a lot ashamed of it, mm -hmm. you know? And so it's just kind of, I'm not, I'm perfect. <laughs> <Go on. laughs> <laughs> it's like all the gross thoughts you ever had and then we're like i hope that goes away <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. I, I hope there's not a secret telepath around me yeah but, like... right. it's the i hope this didn't unlock something in me reno like <laughs> 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 or awaken something in me sorry to steal the community line yes uh so listen in the discord chat someone says they had me at butthole like if you are into buttholes you're gonna love werewolf jones <laughs> you're gonna love werewolf jones <laughs> there's the title right there <laughs> oh my, i don't know how i'm gonna top that because i just want to talk about some dumb fantasy comic but i i will try i guess I, I guess before I get into my pick for this week, we had some folks hanging out with us on Discord today. Uh, Hugh is excited for do a power bomb number three, or that's next on their top of my top of their pile. Danny is going to be reading Batman One Bad Day Riddler number one, and Stephanie is diving into the epic of Alan Moore's Swamp Thing, which is very exciting. I've been meaning to read those books, so Stephanie, I look forward to hearing your thoughts on that. We also got a late entry uh, from Gray, uh, Proteus oh, from Gray. Vex by Michael Carroll and Henry Flint. Oh, thank you. I missed that in the chat. Sorry about that, Gray. Yeah, but the book for me that I'm excited for or going to be reading next is Barbaric Axe to Grind number one. This is Michael Morici um, with art by Nathan Gooden, colors by Addison Duke, and letters by Jim Campbell. And I know I slept on the first run of this series for anyone who's been paying attention and drawing the dots and keeping track and score at home. But this time I refuse because if you didn't read Barbaric Volume 1, you should go back and read that from Fall Comics. It's a really fun three-issue series about a barbarian and his talking axe and a wizard and all of the problems and excitements that you could get into in that type of situation with a talking axe and a wizard. So I, I really enjoyed it. It's really fun. Michael Morici has a lot of fun with this extremely goofy concept of a talking axe who hungers for blood and encourages this barbarian to just kill every evil person they see. Uh, and so this next volume, I don't really know what it's going to be about, but the summary says that <clears throat> Soren, Owen the Barbarian, and Owen's talking axe, this time they're out to settle an old score against Gladius, a wicked asshole who did Owen wrong back in the, his Barbarian days. You know what? Sure. <laughs> Sounds dumb and fun to me. Sounds like Conan the Barbarian with a little bit more flair. Um so let's let's see what what Marici has up up his sleeve. Um, but I really have to say, I the first volume of this again, like really delivered a super fun barbaric fun fantasy that takes the sword and sorcery concept and like adds a lot of humor. I, I felt like a lot of Skull Kickers vibes out of this. So if you're a fan of that old Jim Zub series, I think you'd really really dig this. Um, but this is Vault Comics. This is this is Michael Marici. Like you really can't lose with this combo. I think so. I, I think you're, you're definitely going to dig it. If you're into fantasy comics, um, highly recommend this, this, this new book. I mean, I haven't read it yet. Well, I should say I have read it yet, but um, I also recommend the first volume to, to sum things up. 
part of part of being a massive nerd like I am is listening to that and going, oh, it's funny that the bad guy's name is Gladius because that's a Roman sword and the Romans and the barbarians and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Here's so the... I you know go ahead. Oh, I'm just thinking about like what I said earlier about like the golden age of comics in the modern era and Vault I think kind of started in that era and mm-hmm. there's some other publishers who i would kind of put in that category at the time like maybe aftershock and it seems Mm -hmm. like vault really pulled away from the pack and like rose to the top and i don't hear about aftershock that much anymore and i'm just wondering like what do you guys think about vault like what did they do right to to, because like first of all the fact that they are even still around is a miracle just because starting a new publishing company in comics is like madness and Mm -hmm. um they you know, the Wassel bros are so sweet and they're so smart and they just did such a great job and they got good talent and they treat people nice. And like, I don't know, but like the aftershot guys are smart too. And they had good talent. Like, I don't know. What do you guys think? What was the the magic ingredient for vault? I mean, I think it's just that they're, they're finding talented, creative people and turning them loose. I, I mean, I think it also, like I totally agree with Brian there. I they find some very interesting stories, like it, with unbelievable creative teams, like from folks you never heard of. But they they have a marketing spin that is so aggressive. <laughs> I think more so than a lot of other publishers. I, I feel like I hear about Vault through the grapevine of indie creators more so than almost any other publisher. Um, like in like non big five, I guess publishers, right? Um, I I think that. Yeah, they, they've done a really good job of not only pushing their marketing really hard um, via email chains and stuff like that, but also, I think, doing right by creators. I haven't heard a bad word said about these guys. Oh, you know what else um, just occurred to me? They guarantee their books with comic shops. Like, you could return their books. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Huh. Wonder, I... Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because, like, Danny in the chat just brought up uh, Aftershock, and I, I, I agree with him. Aftershock came and went and then i think they started to come back because i've noticed myself even picking up more of their books recently um and i fell off for a while like they were they were putting out some stuff that it just kind of felt like i don't know low caliber and i don't mean to insult any anybody out there that was making comics but it also felt like a lot of cheap wins um like what was a popular topic let's write a book about it like we've got one already like ready to fire um whereas now i feel like they're leaning more into like kind of genre fiction that is is actually interesting versus just trying to jump on whatever the latest trend is um like i've seen a couple different good books from them recently there were a couple of really really solid marguerite bennett titles from them like there was the lesbian insect like victorian one and then there was Mm -hmm. like the animal Mm -hmm. one and i feel that's not a sentence you can just say (laughs) man Uh, Insects yeah. with an X, right? Where did Marguerite uh, Bennett okay. go? Okay. <laughs> like, I've who ha- has have we done a wellness check on Marguerite Bennett? I haven't heard of her in ages. Yeah, I have no idea. I that's now 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 you got me curious. I'm googling furiously over here. Anyway, but I, you yeah, just made I, me think- she was she was there for a minute, and then I don't know, maybe she just dropped off. You know, sometimes folks have just. Uh, Sometimes, I don't know, I think the pandemic also hit a lot of people yeah. in different ways, right? Creative output just probably dropped. So can't blame her. You know, if she just d- fucked off. You know, I <laughs> totally get it. Tough, tough to be creative when you're just kind of looking around and screaming all the time. Very. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But yeah, um, glad Vault. But yeah, I mean, Vault, I think, has persisted just because the, you know, the, the guys running that company are really persistent. And I also think that they have some really fucking good books. Like, and I know there are other publishers out there that have kind of grown over the last couple of years, like Scout and AWA. And there's there's a couple other smaller publishers, but like Black Mask, where did they go? Oh, right. Like they were putting well, out some books for a minute. They had a lot of behind the scenes, like problems. Yeah, but that's what I mean. Like, I think that there's like, comic industry business shit that some companies fall into that vault somehow has managed to get away from because i think they're really trying to be as straight and narrow yeah. about their company as possible well i'm happy they're they're doing good doing good comics and they're doing good in comics so keep it up definitely vault. yeah so go go buy all the vault comics they're all pretty good i think not not there's maybe one bad book for every 10 i think you can do pretty well over there so um yeah, I guess uh, to wrap things up, you know, next week's show, uh, Paloma is going to be joining IRCB. Danny was on the show very recently. 
for his first episode, first, first official episode. All the other ones were fake, um, and Danny's not real until recently. Paloma is going to be joining the show. We're very excited to welcome her. And uh, next week, we're going to be talking about Nightwing and the Bat Fam. I think Danny's going to be on that episode as well. So it's just going to be me and two new folks. So learn to love them. we got some brand new voices coming to the show. Um, but otherwise, you can follow us all on Twitter. You can follow Tia at portrait of madam x spelled the french way you can find find brian at brian head and you can follow me at mike rapin and the show on tiktok and instagram and twitter at ircb podcast this episode first aired on patreon and is possible because of our wonderful patrons join today for exclusive series like ircb movie club saga of saga and more join now at patreon.com slash ircb podcast if you haven't already please rate and review our show give us five stars i think we've earned it at this point uh, you can do that on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, where they do, in fact, have ratings, or wherever you find your podcasts. Join the IRCB Discord community to chat comics and more. Plus, you can listen to our episodes live as we record every week. Join using the link in the show notes. Podcasts grow best when spread by word of mouth. So why not tell your friends, family, and local comic shop about IRCB? Infinity Shred is the best band in the universe. They do all of our music, and we can't thank them enough. Xander edits the show. Do not look directly at him. I want to say thank you to everyone, Brian and Tia, for being on the show this week. Uh, thanks to Nick for proof listening. And until next time, comics are good, and so are you. really have to change the phrase spread by word of mouth in an era of three pandemics like that gives me anxiety yeah. just to even hear yeah, that phrase podcasts are spread best by aerosolized droplets <laughs> <laughs> if only we could get people listening to the show that way that would be great god ircb could stay alive on your clothes for up to 10 days after an episode <laughs> oh my god that's so dark but why are we not using that oh my god hey you're still recording baby oh shit <laughs> Xander, swap that in, swap that in. <laughs> <laughs>